So what we want to focus on with this panel is all about managing behavior. We titled it Coaching the Line because when you set the standard, that draws the line. And Sherry, I was talking to you about how you illustrate setting clear standards with your team. And you talked about a video. We're going to play this video. There won't be any sound to it, so you can talk to it. Talk about what you're trying to accomplish with this. Well, this is one of the first things that we show our guys. They all reported to campus this past Sunday to start summer session, and this is um, the first video that they actually saw. And what it is is a compilation of those things that we group um, into a category called championship behavior, which is it encompasses who you are. When you are an Oklahoma women's basketball player, this is what you do because this is who you are. And it has to do with pointing to the guy who passed you the ball when you scored, uh, sprinting to help a teammate up after they take a charge, um, showing emotion, uh, touching. We have a touching rule. How many touches can we get uh, in a practice? Sometimes we count those. And so you, you see in this video um, lots of shared emotion from player to player, uh, lots of guys rushing to help one another up, the pointing to the passer, the bench being involved, all those things that we think are um, uh, the real backbone of what we do. I love that, and, and I think one of the things that I'd like to talk about now is how to catch above the line behavior. And what I want to do is I want to show you a clip of Coach K, and then Jack, after Coach K is done, I'd just like to get your thoughts on what he said. We as coaches can always catch a kid doing something wrong, <laughs> and we overlook the things that they're doing right. They'll do less wrong things if we catch the right things. And so, a right thing is not just hitting the bucket. A right thing is a kid saying something that's encouraging. The right thing is a block out, a rebound, uh, being smart in a certain situation, you know, being enthusiastic on the bench, you know, uh, helping a teammate. Boy, that was really good. Jimmy, you, you really helped John in that, in that case. Uh, pointing those things out or pointing out winning winning plays. <laughs> well, just keeping it real as a coach, you know, I probably got that wrong for about 20 years. Uh, <laughs> I'm from the McAfee clan, and there's always something wrong, you know, and I was the guy that always pointed it out, but uh, I, uh, can I, I... Can I ask you a question on that? Why do you think it took you so long? Um, <laughs> well, we were successful, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's hard to audit success. It really, you know, it takes a bit of experience to, to really make changes when you're, when you're winning. Um, but it's the right thing to do, you know. I mean, I think if we were having a bad training session and I called the team in and just gave them the business, you know, somebody's making a physical breakdown, a skill breakdown, somebody has a mental breakdown, somebody else has effort, and they're kind of boxcarring those mistakes together. Um, I really had 20 years of, you know, giving them the business and sending them back out there, and it never got better once. And, uh, and then you just find a way to... You know, as Coach Hay says, find something positive. You know, a guy passes the ball to another guy, and it's a good pass. The guy drops it. It drives me crazy the guy dropped the ball. But I say good pass. And, uh, you know, with just some positive speak sometimes, you can really pull a team, you know, out of a funk, you know. You, you've got to, you know, keep it real. I mean, you can't say you look sharp in your unis today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I mean, I think, there's, I think there's a way with positive speak and, and speaking to people's strengths especially, that you can, uh, you, can, you can build the right culture and at the same time you can pull a team out of a funk. And, and is there a time that it's okay or acceptable to be negative in your mind? Well, well there's always a time to be honest. And, uh, and, I, and I think that we, you know, we, we need to have the correct touchstones where we can really be honest with the team, you know, know where we stand. Uh, but I'm, I try to train myself to go 70-30 strengths to when I'm talking about something that we're not doing well. I, I want to spend most of my time talking about what we're doing well, what we can do anytime, anywhere, and how we leverage it. And, and I think that's where I'd like to go next is talking about how to manage below the line behavior. And Rob, I'm actually going to toss this to you first because what's unique about a strength coach is there's no judgment in that relationship because you're not making executive decisions on whether or not that person plays. So can you talk about, just to the strength coaches out there, the role that you play in coaching below the line behavior? The best uh, thing, the tool that's worked for me, probably the greatest when somebody's below that level is uh, just try to flip the script on them a little bit and I'll say, well, let's just flip roles here and let's say 
I just demonstrated the behavior you did, and, and you're, you're the coach, you're the strength coach, you're running the session today. How would you feel about what I just did? And then it kind of puts their mindset where they look at it from a totally different perspective, and they get out of that defense mechanism that sometimes they go to. And so that's been successful for me. But usually uh, I try to pull them in the office and not in the setting that they're in, maybe grab them after the session, uh, and then try to kind of go at it from that perspective. So you, you essentially create awareness. Yes. Right? And, and another way you do it, can you talk about um, accountability with penalty? Well, I think it goes back to a little bit like we're kind of the first line when they hit there, and I think it's important. Uh, and for me as a strength coach, as you said, I don't control playing time, uh, you know, who's in the rotation, those things. So I can pretty much treat everybody the same which I think in turn helps when they get handed off to the coach. So for us, we're very strict, the discipline, the accountability, what's expected, and we don't deviate from that. It doesn't matter if you're an All-American or you're somebody that just joined the team. Uh, in our world, we're able to do that because we don't, you know, we're not concerned with maybe we've got a game coming up this week or things like that. And, and so it's almost like you're paying a fine. It, it's like, we call it like a speeding ticket, and I tell them, look, look uh, we just pay the fine and move on, and, and there's no ill will, but this is And there's no the emotion, really, here. is there? None. Yeah. None. Yes. And so, like, let's say a guy's late to class. Right. What would be the ticket? Uh, for us, we use a Stairmaster. It's been a pretty nice little tool. <laughs> and they just have a certain number of floors that they have to get done in a certain time, and uh, they just know that's the standard, and that's been there for years, and we've had a lot of players before they've been good players, and... Occasionally things will happen. Maybe an alarm doesn't go off, and it's just part of the part of the world we're in. And, and talk about the importance of having someone walk in and see the best player on the stairmaster for missing a class. Well, I think that's huge. And, and over the years, and and sometimes you know, yours a little bit leery. You know, uh, you know, I was in Gainesville. Is Coach Spurrier going to be upset that I've got you know our top kid on the stairmaster? And and uh, but I think that it just sets the standard that. Everybody, when they see this is the best kid on the team, this or this is someone that's highly acclaimed, and he's paying the fine, so it's okay if I pay the fine. And so, really, the art of coaching is when you have a clear standard and someone's operating below that, how do you, in the moment, change that? And, Becky, I'm going to toss it to you. Let's say in a practice setting, you have different tools to reset. Do you want to share one? Yeah, one of the ones we use is at any time during our training session, uh, any player can call a timeout. And that timeout could be to reset, it could be to get more energy in the group, it could be that maybe there's some confusion and they want to have some clarity, but I think it allows them to have the power to recognize that they can stop it, fix it, and then get better from it. And it's, it's kind of cool because we're not the ones calling it. So sometimes, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, Somebody going to call a timeout here? Let's go. But they, you know, what happens is they, they eventually recognize it. And when they are driving that, it's so much more powerful than if I stopped and yelled at everybody. And so self-correction, I think, is a, a great tool, creates awareness. And then I think peer support as well is, is really helpful. And one of the things I'd like to toss over to Jack is I have a, a buddy, and I'd just like to get your thoughts on this that uh, he says the way I try and correct below the line behavior is I want the athlete to see me, see them. So that'll create the awareness and then I'll, I'll use my eyes to let them know I'm watching them. But I don't like to take a lot of the team practice time to coach individual behavior. What are your thoughts on that, Jack? Yeah, I mean, it's just efficient, right? I mean, we don't really have time to um... 20-hour work week, right? We, we really don't have time to, to stop and, and discuss behavior as it happens, I don't believe, certainly in training where most of the volume occurs. Um, I, I think it's important we get as much done on the front end as we can, build the right expectations uh, so the student athletes know their responsibilities. Um, but no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm motor learning skill, you know, let's, let's describe the aims of the, of the activity, uh, let's, uh, let's you know, offer demonstration if necessary. Let's progressively rep the activity under escalating pressure, put a summary on it, move to the next exercise. There's really not time to discuss with somebody that their body language is bad in that moment, I don't believe. And if there's one thing that I've learned from Jack, he has an unbelievable ability to coach proactively. 
So the majority of the stuff that you do is covered on the Yeah, oh yeah. And so I guess transitioning, how can we cover this last piece? The athletic director that said the hardest thing about standards is you are the standard. I think you have to have people outside of you that can help you self-assess. Becky, how do you do that? Well, I think a big part of that is just having trusted people around you. So I use like our strength and conditioning coach, our trainer. Um, I actually room on the road with our communications person who sees things in a very different light because she's not necessarily on the field all the time. And all those different people hear different things around your team. You know, in the training room, like you can hear everything. Um, even in the weight room, you know, I'm sure Rob has heard plenty of his share of stories. But when they hear that information and they can give me feedback, and when they have the trust that they can tell me, like, hey, you're going off the rails a little bit, you need to be a little bit more positive, or you need to change this message. Like, I love when they will give me that type of honest feedback. And I also rely on my assistant coaches for that as well. But I think with the assistant coaches, we're all so tightly wound into the practice, it's great to have someone who's a little bit outside of it. Jack, how do you do it? Um, you know, I, I, I think we have a responsibility to kind of audit ourselves. So I think the important part is to sit down and, you know, just audit everything you do, every approach that you have. How, how is this, how, how are we doing this? Is it meeting its goals? And I think what you'll find is that there'll be a lot of stuff you're doing really well and you can double down on those things. There'll be a bunch of stuff you'll immediately want to pivot away from. You'll, you'll never want to do, that, do it that way again. And then there's a bunch of stuff inconclusive that you, you know, need to use your gut with. But, you know, coaches have to want to know, you know. You know, you know, that's what science is about. I mean, why guess when you can know, right? And, and so we have, to, we have to have the discipline to audit ourselves. And it's interesting because, Sherry, Becky alluded earlier, you just got inducted to the Hall of Fame. Congratulations. And when you have more success, like Jack just said earlier, it's very easy to become convicted. And I was asking you, and, and really, when you have success, it's harder sometimes, sometimes, for your assistants to be honest with you, especially if they're younger. And so I was asking you, how, how do you self-assess? And you shared a great story with me. Before I share that story, I just want to say it's one of the best things I've ever heard. Jack said, coaches have to want to know. Gosh, I love that. I'm going to put it in everybody's office. That's awesome. Um, I, I think, and again, before I get the story, real quick, I, I got us back on time earlier. I can take us over time now. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I use, I watch practice film every night, every single night, and I watch it a little bit for what we're doing in half-court offense and a little bit for maybe a defensive breakdown drill, but I really watch me, and it's awful. I just want to tell you, like, you just think, what, why did you lose your mind right there? It was not that big of a deal. And then you'll watch something, and you know, why did I let that go? That was the big deal. And so it's, it's painful, I'll tell you. It's, it's incredibly painful, but it's very helpful. And um, that's the truest sense, because video doesn't lie. Um, the, and in terms of the story that, that I had told Brett, I ha I'm very fortunate to have a, a collection of mentors who um, tell me the truth. They don't tell me what I want to hear. They, they tell me what I need to hear. And... Uh, at one point during the season when our team was struggling with a confidence issue and they just, they, nobody believed in themselves and we didn't play with any bravado and I'm at my wit's end and I call this guy and I go, I don't get it. You've always told me that teams reflect their coaches. I think that I have confidence. I think that I walk around like I think I could do anything. I don't understand. And he said, you're the mirror. And I said, I know I'm the mirror. And he said, you're not reflecting yourself. You're reflecting them back to them. And I went, oh. Thank you. <laughs> and then went in the fetal position for a little bit and wept. And then um, <laughs> got myself back together and realized that, that my job is to reflect to my players their very best image of themselves and that I hadn't been doing that. And it changed things. And, and how helpful is that group of mentors? Oh, you, you got to have them. You got to have them. And they're, they're the guys that always pick up the phone and the conversations aren't always lengthy. Sometimes they're pretty quick. That one was pretty brief. I wanted to get off the phone. Um, but, but they have, and I think too, my, for, for me, my group is not all in my basketball world. They're outside, maybe men's basketball coaches, football coaches, people who are, are in a, a different arena because they can see more clearly. And our staff is super close. We've been together for so long. 
that we, as Becky said, kind of breathe the same air and drink the same water, and so it's hard for us to distinguish among ourselves, even though they're, they're ready, willing, and able to tell me if they think I'm off track. They just can't always see it because we're usually off track together, and so that outside um, viewpoint is very important. Yeah, and so if, if maybe we were going to sum this whole thing up, it would be the only way that you can coach the line, the only way you can coach standards, is to actually have them. And the way you have them is to close the gap of interpretation. And then once you have those, how you manage above the line is critical, okay? But then how you convert below the line is critical. And the last one, you have to be the standard. And the best way you can assess is to get an outside party to look at you, to talk through things with you, and help you understand and become more self-aware. Let's give it up for these guys.